ourselves as well as we need to. There has been a real conscious awakening within the Adventist church of a lot of people who are moving in the direction of celebrating the festivals. Have you folk heard any of this? I had an elder in one of the churches I was pastoring a little while ago uh, who came to me and started asking me some questions as to whether we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians should be keeping the festivals. Now, have you not as a Bible student, ladies and gentlemen, wanted to know how the Bible works and why certain the Bible works a certain way, what the theologians call biblical hermeneutics. These are principles of biblical interpretation. Have you ever tried to figure out, well, why do we interpret the Bible a certain way? You know what I, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says, that no prophecy of the Scriptures is of, is of any private what? Interpretation. We're going to be talking about that later on in this presentation here this evening. Nobody has the right to interpret Scripture for themselves. None of us have that right that has not been granted to us. And I'm grateful for that. And we're going to learn later on the reason why none of us have been granted that, ladies and gentlemen, because if it was left up to us to interpret Scripture, we would come up with all kinds of different ideas, wouldn't we? The only way to understand the Bible is by letting the Bible interpret itself. And if churches understood this today, it doesn't matter what their religious affiliation is, if they understood this today, ladies and gentlemen, we wouldn't have over 5,000 different Christian denominations in North America. Another claim they make... <clears throat> They say God's true people at the end of time will, ob will be observing all of his days, the seventh day Sabbath and the yearly holy days. So notice what they're doing, ladies and gentlemen. They're making a division here. What they're basically saying is if you and I are not keeping the annual festivals, irrespective of the fact we're keeping the Sabbath, guess what? We're not God's true people. Again, does the Bible and the spirit of prophecy support this position? And we need to investigate this. Sabbath and the feast, the seventh day Sabbath, together with all other annual feast days and Sabbaths. Now listen to what they say here, friends. They stand and fall together. And one of the reasons they're using this argument is based upon Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. What we all basically have studied and what we've learned in the past. And we're going to investigate this text. We're going to break it down. According to the most recent biblical scholarly study, we now have a very clear definitive stance regarding this. It's even written up in the new, newer version of what Seventh-day Adventists believe, the 2005 edition. I want to encourage you to get that because it explains very clearly there our stand regarding Colossians 2, verses 14 to 16. The, the sad reality is that the festival keepers have come along and they've tried to turn this text into something, especially verse 16, into something that the Bible does not back up. So how do we deal with this, ladies and gentlemen? How do we contend with this? The only way to really deal with it properly is to go back to your Bible, go back to the Spirit of Prophecy, and look very carefully at what the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy is saying. Now remember what I said earlier on. It is the devil's objective to make the Spirit of Prophecy of none effect. The devil does not want you to have that as a resource to go back and study. Well, Colossians 2.16. When the Sunday law is passed, they claim... Adventists will finally see that their position on Colossians 2.16 has been defenseless. There will be only two choices open to them. Join the S-Day Feast Keepers and embrace all of God's holy days or join the evangelicals who do not keep any of these festivals and give up the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, here's what they go on to say. Feast Keepers then declare, we predict that they will give up the Sabbath. Really? Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is a statement that I take offense to personally. Because if this is true, there must be Bible backing up, backing up this kind of a statement and this kind of a, a prediction. If they honestly believe this, show me the biblical evidence, show me the evidence in the spirit of prophecy. And if it's not there, then this claim is what? It's false. It's a false claim. So we're going to investigate this this evening, ladies and gentlemen, we'll start to get into this as we lay down the principles. But nowhere do you find written in the spirit of prophecy where Ellen White is arguing for the keeping of the festivals. And if Ellen White was a festival keeper and she believed that this was based upon the Bible, what do you think the prophet of the church would have told us? To keep the feasts. And yet there's not one iota of evidence in the spirit of prophecy to validate that. Not one iota. Everything I have read from the books that I have read from the Feast Keepers, friends, everything I have read 
has been taken out of context. And you know what a text out of context is, don't you? A text out of context is a pretext. You don't arrive at the truth that way. It ends up being an assumption based upon your own human reasoning. And that is a very dangerous place for you and I to put ourselves. Again, the second principle we're going to look at, the text says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Notice what Jesus did, ladies and gentlemen. He began at Moses and all the what? All the prophets, the Bible says. Now, let me challenge you with this thought. Let me challenge you with this thought. Could Jesus, could Jesus have come along and said, hey guys, look at my hands. Look at my feet. Look at my side. Look at my head. Where all the wounds took place. Could Jesus have done that? Could Jesus have turned around and said, hey guys, it's me. Watch, I'm going to turn these stones into bread right before your very eyes. Could Jesus have performed a miracle? Could he have done that, ladies and gentlemen? He could have done that. He could have done all those things. But notice, he did not do those things to substantiate who he was. He took those two disciples back into the word of God. And that's what we need to do as Christians. They don't study it chronologically. They just grab here and there. They're making the same mistake that people out there are making today. And that's why we have over 5,000 different Christian denominations today. And we're in the state that we're in. So you see, friends, there must be chronological interpretation. Take the subject, study it through the Bible. Amen? Proof text it all through the scriptures. There's an experience that took place. I won't tell you where, but it's where uh, a pastor or a gentleman who was studying for the ministry had this experience with a, room, a roommate. And this roommate said to him one day, he said, listen, doesn't the Bible say that, God, that, that David was a man after God's own heart? And the, and the individual who was studying theology said, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. He was a man after God's own heart. And this individual went on to say, well, God never changes his moral standards. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? And the theology student said, yeah, that's right. And he went on to say, well, David had many wives. Isn't that right? And the theology student said, yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And this individual went on to say, well, guess what? I've discovered that I, I have the gift of polygamy. Now, look at the logic going on here, friends. It might be logically correct, but is it theologically correct? The answer is no. This individual had come to this conclusion because he did not chronologically follow the story through. So let's take a look at it chronologically. So here's the principle. Start at the beginning, then examine the topic through time, observing all the factors over time. Finally, draw what? Draw conclusions.